On the 13th of September, 1944, lay on the floor of the concentration camp in Dachau, the great-great-granddaughter of Tipu Sultan, the once mighty ruler of Mysore. Now this beautiful princess was tortured and then brutally shot through the head by an SS guard. Her name was Noor Inayat Khan, but for the people who shot her, she was Nora Baker, a British spy. And this is her story. Hi, my name is Misha and welcome to Tarikhi Tales. Here we talk about the historical tales based on research and I give you all the links down in the description box. If you like this content, make sure to like, share, subscribe and if you want to help me grow this channel, you can help me by going on my Patreon linked in the description box. Her actual name was Noura Nisa Inayat Khan and she was born on the 1st of January 1914 in Moscow. Now her link to this great king Tipu Sultan of Mysore was through her father, Hazrat Inayat Khan. Her mother was an American called Ora Ray Baker. Now even though Noor was born in Moscow, she had to move several times and she spent most of her time growing up in Paris. So she was not only familiar with the language but also with the lifestyle. Now her father passes away in 1927 and her mother basically went into a deep depression and Noor at a very young age had to step up and kind of take care of her family. He had studied at Sorbonne and had now started writing stories, especially children's stories, as her career. And it was going quite well because her stories were not only getting published, but also being very well liked by the masses. Now, in 1940, when France was invaded by the Nazis during the Second World War, Noor and her family had to escape to England. Now, during this time, the war was at full throttle and living a normal life in those areas was not comprehensible. Now, when Noor's brother, Vilayat, decided that he's going to be joining the RAF, which is the Royal Air Force under the British, so Noor also decided that she wants to do more towards the war cause and she wants to be involved hands-on. So she decided that she also wants to volunteer for the WAAF, which is the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Here, she was trained as a radio operator and in fact, she became one of the first people, one of the first women in Britain to be trained in this field. Now, one of the reasons as to why Noor probably thought that it's a good idea to join the WAAF is because by this time, there was a lot of propaganda going on in these European nations encouraging women to take up roles that were traditionally held by men. And joining the Air Force unit was one such role. Initially, Noor had actually joined to become a nurse. And it was after some time that she decided that she wanted to do more and she transitioned into this role. But there was another organization that had now kind of spotted Noor and they were keeping an eye on her. And this was the SOE, the Special Operation Executive. Because the SOE was basically kind of looking for people within these auxiliary air force units and other units that could become handy as spies and Noor kind of checked all the different boxes that they were looking for. She not only had language skills, she also had a British passport and she was also brought up in Paris. Now what was the SOE, right? The SOE was basically an organization set up by Winston Churchill. Now he set this up to kind of help these other countries who were involved in the war to basically have some help in the resistance movements that were brewing in these countries. Their job was basically sabotage and providing arms and money to the resistance groups as well as becoming like a bridge of communication between Britain and these resistance groups against the Nazis. Who was perfect for this role because she was fluent in French, she knew the area well, there were no Google Maps and such, right? She was also trained as a wireless operator, meaning she could send back information efficiently. But it was one of the most dangerous fields that you could put anybody in. Anyways, Noor was called in for an interview at the SOE. At this point, Noor herself had no idea what the SOE was or what she was basically being called in for. Now, she was called at the Victoria Hotel and here, she met a guy called Sluin Jepsen. They spoke in French for a while and then Noor was told that 
she would be sent to France as an undercover agent after being given some training. It was then that she was told that she would be, now because she would be undercover, she would have no protection because she's not going to be in uniform. There would be nobody around her that could help her, that could protect her. And if she was caught, she'd be shot dead. And without a moment's hesitation, Noor agreed to take the job. I mean, she was a brave, brave woman. And when she left the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, it wasn't like there was a goodbye or anything. Suddenly, one day, she just stopped showing up. Nobody knew what had happened, where she had gone, or what was going on at all. Now, her training begins. I was like a classic spy school kind of a thing. She was taught to handle guns, handle explosives. She was already trained by the... WAAF as a wireless operator. She was also taught how to break locks, how to kill, how to find sources, how to use dead and live letterboxes. Her skills in wirelessly sending codes like Morse code were also improved. Agents were also taught about the life in France. They were shown photographs of the enemy to basically be able to recognize them through their uniforms. They were taught about the Gestapo, about the French militia, about the resistance programs, everything. There were also like trainings that they had to pass in order to get through this. And one thing to note, the SEO wasn't like this perfect spy school that we see in stories or like these, you know, weird cartoons. Um, it had a lot of flaws especially for women, because the programs for men and women were the same and women were expected to match that level. Women were also put through additional tests that men were not put through because men were expected to already know all of that stuff. And a lot of it was physical attributes. Have a look at this. This is one of the instruction manuals of the SOE that was giving advice to agents on how to dress. As I mentioned, there were tests with these trainings and once Noor gave her final test, there was a big question on one of her reports. This is one of the SOE reports on Noor Nayat Khan. It asks whether she was even a good agent or a good fit. And we can see that there are two people who are talking about her on this form. One of them is basically commenting that she's not overburdened with brains. She's not very smart. But the person who's going over this report kind of marks down in pencil that we don't want them overburdened with brains, kind of signaling that they wanted the agents to be only a certain level of smart. They wanted them to follow instructions rather than think about them too much. The person writing the report also says that she has an unstable and temperamental personality, to which the other person says that nonsense. So yeah, after all that training and everything, Noor was also given a code name and her code name was Madeline. She also practiced her signature like there were a lot of details that the agents did um, kind of had to focus on and this is one of the papers that shows her practicing her signature as Madeline. Then finally, after all that training, Noor was assigned a mission. We are going to France to work as a wireless operator for a locally recruited organizer who is established in the region of Le Mans. Now, look at all of this. These are the coordinates that she needs to go to. This was how she was going to meet her agents. And she was also given instructions on exactly what to do. She had a cover story and she was given finances as well as means for communications. Nora flew out on June 16th with her immediate head, Vera Atkins. Just before leaving, last minute, her pockets were checked to make sure that she had no English objects on her, like English cigarettes or English train tickets or any of these small things that might give her away. In return, she was given a false passport, some francs to use as money, her pistol, and a set of four pills, including the lethal cyanide pill, in case she needed it. Now, agents were always flown out by the SOE on full moon nights because the full moon gave them enough visibility to land. And the line of lights in an L shape was basically drawn in the area that signaled that it's safe to land. Now, these agents kind of operated in circuits. So there was like a group of people that were going to be meeting each other and they were part of one SOE circuit. So when Noor landed in France, she basically headed on over alone to the accommodations that she was given and joined her circuit. So now Noor's circuit was basically called Cinema. This was a sub-circuit of the bigger circuit called Prosper. And the person who was heading the circuit of Prosper was called 
Henry Gary. Now he's a very important character because he'll come in later in the story or somebody related to him. So remember him. Now immediately after Noor arrived in France, there were some inherent flaws in the training of the SOE that became evident. For example, Noor was never taught how to use the French ration system because at that time food was being rationed in France. So Noor didn't know what to do with that, right? So she simply didn't eat for almost 24 hours after being in France because she was never taught how to use that system. Anyways, after landing, she started transmission 72 hours later and she was on the job. Now, but the thing is, these circuits, they were very important and agents were told to not interact with each other on the field because that could compromise the entire circuit. And it was exactly such behavior that did compromise Noor's circuit. Only a week after Noor had started her job and her mission, the entire circuit was compromised. It was not because of Noor, it was because of some other agents. They were caught and they betrayed the other agents in the circuit. The Gestapo basically gathered in all these other agents and took a hold of these wireless sets as well. Noor closely escaped these Gestapo officers a couple of times and she was advised by the SOE to return back home because now there's literally no cover and she's on her own. But Noor refused to do so and continued gathering information about the betrayals and about the activities in France. Now, the, one of the reasons that Noor didn't go back was that she realized that she's literally one of the last radio links in France that the British government has. She's one of the last remaining agents. The others have been rounded up. So she realized the pivotal role she could be playing in the war effort against the Nazis. It's said that she single-handedly started doing the work of six radio operators. The next three months, Noor kept this up and she was constantly playing a game of cat and mouse with the Gestapo officers because they knew of her, but they just couldn't capture her as of now. And she turned out to be weirdly resourceful. Now, because all of her other links were compromised, she drew upon links that she had from her previous life. She drew upon school teachers, upon acquaintances. She used different addresses. And she did all of this to help London pinpoint the location for arms drop and for money drop to the French resistance. She was basically running around France and she would carry her wireless set with her and that was kind of fitted into a suitcase. And she had a lot of close encounters with German officers that she was able to escape. I'll tell you a few of them. One day she was at the metro station and she was stopped and questioned by two German officers. And because Noor was actually very witty and she did have a feminine kind of a charm, which is also something that's mentioned in her SOE training reports, by the way. So Noor kind of kept her cool and she played it back on the officers. She basically said, can't you see it's a cinematographic apparatus? Basically something related to cinematography. And because this was something that was very new at the time, the officers were kind of ashamed to admit that they didn't know what it was. And they didn't know about what kind of an apparatus is a cinematographer's apparatus, right? So they just let her go. Another time was when Noor was hiding out in an apartment and in order to transmit, she had to basically hang an aerial signal catching device somewhere high up outside the building. And she was doing so on a tree nearby. And what happened was that while she was hanging the device, she heard a voice asking if she wanted some help. And when she turned around, it was a German officer who was asking her. So she basically, again, kept her cool and rather than panicking, she basically went into a very feminine kind of an energy and she bashfully stated that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just you know, something of the sort that she's trying to get some signals to hear the radio because she really wants to and she really misses it. And she played into that helpless female character and that worked. The German officer, and by, by the way, Hearing a radio transmission at that point in the war was banned. So technically, she couldn't do that even as a regular citizen. And because she was so charming, the German officer actually helped her hang the Ariel, which she used for her transmission. And back at the SOE headquarters, people were surprised as to how well she was doing and how 
much better she was than all the other officers that had by this point been caught. And Noor was actually set to fly back to England and she would have made it back safe and sound had she not been betrayed. And who betrayed her? Remember that guy I told you about, the head of their prosper circuit, Henry Gary? He had a sister called Renee Gary and she sold Noor's current address to the Nazis for 100,000 francs at that time, which was a huge amount of money. So now that they had her address and Noor had no idea that she was betrayed, the Gestapo forces basically cornered her in and arrested her. Soon after being arrested and taken back to prison, Noor actually tried to escape, but she was caught. After this, she made one more attempt to escape. And this was a, an amazing attempt. I mean, why is there no movie on her life? It's so interesting. Maybe there is. I don't know. Is there? Do you guys know? Let me know in the comments. Anyways, another escape she tried was that she basically, along with two other prisoners, they loosened the skylight, the sky window, and they got on the roof of the prison and they were about to escape. But at the same time, the RAF, one that her brother had joined, the Royal Air Force from the British side, they started bombing that area, even as those prisoners were on the roof. Now, because of the bombing, the, the bomb sirens went off. The protocol in the prisons were started, the rooms were searched, and it was found out that three prisoners are missing. And soon they were found on the roof. Had the bombing not coincided with the escape, they would have been able to get away and that would have been one of the most daring escapes of all times, especially by a female in that day and age. Noor was now labelled as a highly dangerous prisoner because this was her second attempt to escape. And the orders for her transfer came directly from Berlin and she became one of the first women agents to be sent to a German jail. Now, because of her status and because of her attempts to escape, she was kept shackled at all times. Her hands were tied with chains, her feet were tied. She was given food when there was no one in the corridor. So she was basically kept in isolation. She was barely able to feed herself or even clean herself. She was regularly beaten. She was tortured brutally. But Noor remained resilient and she gave up no information about her circuit. She never even mentioned a name. There's even an incident where Noor would write messages. She would scratch messages on the food bowl. And in that way, she was able to make a connection with other prisoners in the jail. She once wrote Viva la France and some other girls actually wrote back to her some encouraging words. So it was in these small ways that she kept herself alive. There are reports by other prisoners saying that they could hear her crying at night and they could hear sounds of her being hit, slapped and interrogated. On September 11th, she was asked to come out of her cell and she was able to scratch a message on her food bowl which said, I am leaving. She was taken out of there, then met up with some of her other colleagues and they were told that you're going to be working as agricultural laborers and they were being driven off to Munich. But... She didn't realize that the person who was driving them had their execution orders with him at that time. They were taken to the concentration camp in Dachu. She had a horrible night for her. All night, Noor was tortured, Noor was beaten. And maybe because she was dark-skinned, some historians claim, because there was a lot of racism in the Nazis, obviously. The entire ideology is based on that. She was tortured immensely. I mean, it's very heartbreaking to read those reports. Now, after all this torture, when she had almost completely collapsed, she was asked to kneel and she was shot point blank in the back of her head and killed. The guard who killed her was called Wilhelm Rupert and her body was immediately thrown into the fire and burned. That night, the same night, both her brother and her mother, who were back in England, had the same dream. Noor came to them in their dream, surrounded by a blue light. And she said the same thing, that I am free. On 16 January 1946, she was awarded this reward, which was the highest French honor that a civilian ever receives. And three years later in England, in 1949, she was awarded the George Cross as well. In France, Noor is remembered as Madeleine, a heroine of the resistance. There is a plaque outside her home in France and a band plays music outside her home every year on Bastille Day. There's also been a square that has been named after her, after the nickname Madeleine, 
and she's also been coined the term as modern day Joan of Arc by the mayor of Paris. So that was the story of the great great granddaughter of Tipu Sultan who was once the mighty ruler of Mysore and what a story this was honestly i hope you liked it and i hope we can all preserve her memory her legacy and her bravery because at the end she died persevering in all the things that she believed in right if you like this video please give it a thumbs up share it with other people and if you want such content to be continued to be made head on down below to the link in the description box to my patreon see you guys next time bye